Hello and welcome. In the next year, uh, many Indian companies, businesses, conglomerates could see transitions in leadership. Uh, the key issue that's uh, coming up again and again and or more often than perhaps before is succession because many uh, business leaders who perhaps uh, also set up businesses in the last few decades are also reaching their 70s and 80s and are likely to transition. A biggest perhaps example is Mukesh Ambani himself who has uh, brought in three of his children onto the board of Reliance Industries and their affiliate companies with the whole idea of transition and he's uh, said so himself. But that's the perhaps the biggest example but there are many other companies and uh, organizations uh, including uh, Kotak Bank. Uh, Uday Kotak had to step down uh, from uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the bank because of uh, Reserve Bank of India restrictions on uh, age and tenure. Uh, there are many others like uh, AM Nayak of LNT who's already stepped aside, HDFC's Deepak Parik who has stepped aside, uh, Pratap Reddy, uh, Dr. Pratap Reddy of Apollo Hospitals who, has, uh, who is uh, close to retirement, Anand Bahindra, Mahindra Group, Pawan Munjal, Venu Srinivasan, Kiran Mazumdar Shah. So there are so there are two or three things that bring or stitch these uh, names together. One is of course that they are all high, uh, very prominent business leaders, but also they belong to a generation which has built businesses successfully and is also now reaching, like I said earlier, the 70s and 80s, uh, and uh, therefore it is logical that they would uh, now step aside for the next generation. So which brings us to the question of how is the next generation being uh, geared, prepared? and how prepared are they to take on the reins of clearly very successful organizations with vast stakeholder interests including shareholders and uh, stock markets and so on. So to address and talk about this issue, I'm uh, very pleased to be joined by Farad Forbes, co-chairman of Forbes Marshall. Apart from being the co-chairman of Forbes Marshall, which is a leading company in the field of steam engineering, uh, he's also the chairman of the board of Family Business Network International, which is the world's leading uh, family business organization. Uh, the FBN was founded in 189 and is headquartered in uh, Lausanne in Switzerland and brings together 3,600 family businesses, 1,600 16,000 individual members, including 5,000 next generation members and operates out of 65 countries. So the idea is to see now uh, what are the lessons that we perhaps can take away from what's happening in else, uh, elsewhere in the world, but also in, in the very specific context of India, like I referred to, being that the 20, year 2024 could see uh, uh, many more transitions and ought to see perhaps many more transitions. So on that note, uh, Mr. Forbes, thank you so much for joining me and uh, your, let's say, broad observations on where we are and how prepared family businesses are in India as you observe them uh, up close and personal. Thank you, Govind. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me and it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, when we talk about the next gen um, and we have to look at maybe there are three aspects of the next generation entering family businesses. First is exposure and preparation. You referred to that uh, in your earlier comments. The second is the opportunities which now exist for next gen members. And the third is attitudes, generally attitudes of you know, the family and also society. So let's, let's if we look at these three, uh, aspects, talking about exposure and preparation. Firstly, the next gen today have so many opportunities. They have much more by way of, uh, in terms of exposure, they have much more exposure than before. And as a, as a consequence of that, you know, um, because they are being educated overseas at the best of universities, they they have the opportunity to see uh, what's available outside the family business to much greater extent than previous generations did. Uh, so when they have good education, which is part of the preparation, uh, what the education does not do is provide exposure to the family business. And so there's therefore a need to provide that exposure to the family business and the family legacy that goes beyond just the business. So the next gen are able to develop that pride in both, that is the business and the legacy. And it can then be balanced against the external exposures that the next gen gets today. 
So that's as far as exposure and preparation. Preparation is really, you know, I think it comes through good education, uh, exposure outside the family business. And those are opportunities which, you know, many of the family businesses which are leading family businesses in India, the next generation certainly has had that exposure and an opportunity for preparation. The second aspect which I mentioned is about opportunities which are available to the next generation today. There are professional opportunities for the next gen externally, which is which are very much in line with their education and in their specialization. And often what the family business may offer may not sufficiently challenge them. And that's one of the factors which we see all over the world now, not just in India, where as a result, next-gen family members sometimes don't see uh, the same challenge in entering the family business. It's certainly not true for the names that you mentioned, but this is one of the issues which, which does uh, uh, affect many family businesses in terms of, of of attracting the next generation into the family business. Second, within the scope of opportunities, Indian business environment today is very different today to what it was earlier. The interest in India for investment in high quality good businesses creates high valuations and it makes it quite tempting to family members to sell out as well. And we see that as, uh, as, as uh, uh, what sometimes does happen. And again, it's not unique to India. It happens elsewhere as well. Lastly, attitudes. And attitudes have changed. Uh, firstly, on whether the next generation must or should enter the business. And they're much more willing to provide, the, the senior gen is much more willing to provide the next generation with the space to choose, uh, much more so than it was earlier. And related to attitudes too is the attitudes to women next generation members. And particularly this is so for India, where earlier, unfortunately, many of our Indian next generation women members were not sufficiently welcomed into the family business. In fact, the concept was that, well, they get married and then they they sort of marry into the family uh, a business of what they are going to be marrying their husbands for. Uh, but that's changing too. And Indian families are, at last, in my opinion, being much more willing to accept that their women next gen also enter the family business. And I think in some of the names that you've mentioned, we are already seeing uh, the women next gen members taking very active roles. So those are the three aspects which I thought I would just mention in my in my uh, uh, response to you, Govind. Right. So now the the kind of companies that we are talking about, and cl clearly since most attention would be on these companies because they are more public facing, there are shareholders, stakeholders, and so on. Uh, what's your sense in terms of the the preparedness of the current generation, even as they hand over? So two three sub questions to that. One is. Uh, are they, uh, I'm sure conceptually they recognize, but do they recognize that their next generation may or may not be fit uh, for the kind of uh, role that they themselves have in a way charted out for their organization and its uh, growth? Uh, the second is that if there is such a recognition, what are they doing about it? And uh, the third is that uh, are they, in, if, if they recognize or don't recognize, then are they willing to take uh, drastic steps like the sellout, uh, you know, Sipla is a classic case. I'm not getting into what triggered it, but it's evident that uh, there is a second generation or a third generation that uh, is not likely to or does not want to take over the business. And therefore, uh, the, the best thing to do is to sell the business. Well, again, different motivations depending on the circumstances. Uh, in terms of preparation, if the next gen you know, you know, I think we often hear this, that if the next gen family member enters the family business, uh, is the business not being professionalized? And I think we make, need to make a distinction between professionalization. You can have a next gen family member who's as professional 
as any non-family member executive. And similarly, you can have a non-family executive as unprofessional as anyone. So I think we should make the distinction between the two. Uh, in terms of whether the next gen members enter the business, um, obviously there needs to be adequate preparation and there has to be adequate acceptance by the current generation in terms of providing the opportunity for development. And that development is not just exposure to good education, but also exposure to the business such that that next generation member is adequately qualified to lead the business if they're going to enter the business. But there are other opportunities and other ways for a family member to be involved. Usually what happens every next generation in a family business, whether a listed company or unlisted company, and particularly most, most family businesses are not listed. And so as a consequence, um, the aspects which, which one deals with in a listed company are less, less um, the requirements. Uh, so consequently, what happens is that you can be involved with the family business in other ways. You may not be involved in the same way where your senior generation was. So you may be qualified for doing other things, but you can still be on the board of the company. Uh, you can be on the family council if it's a large family. Uh, and you have every possibility of influencing the family businesses future growth and success, not being directly involved in day-to-day -day management. So it's possible to do that. And there's a role, there's a very constructive, positive role, which you can play in such a capacity as well. So one needs to think about that too. It need not be that you become the CEO of the company. You can be a co-CEO, you could be involved in management, working on business development, business expansion, new businesses, things like that. Or you may not be involved in management at all. And you may just be involved in the governance of the establishment. So those are the those are the possibilities really which exist. Yeah. So let me put the question uh, a little differently. So if you were to take 10 uh, business leaders of family businesses in India and you could choose any 10 in your mind how many do you think are would want to or would insist on the next generation staying within the company and running it even though clearly or at least outsiders there is some sacrifice involved in performance vision delivery and so on well I mean, it's hard to sort of judge that. And I think you have to really go by um, the preparation of the, the, the specific family and the specific family business. Um, if you look at overall family business performance, um, there are many studies which show that actually family businesses outperform non-family firms. Now, there must be a reason why that happens, right? So that happens, and this is over generations. I mean, you know, if you look at, if you look at firstly, longevity, um, we talk about statistics like, you know, it's the statistics are something like 13% of family businesses make it through the second generation, okay? Um, actually, make thirteen percent make it through the third generation. About two thirds make it make it through the second generation. Now, if you take one generation as thirty years, you're talking about two thirds making it through sixty years, and thirteen percent making it through ninety years. You know, so, so there's obviously some value to what family businesses do, and in terms of performance, there are many studies which also show that family businesses do 
perform well, in, in many cases actually outperform non-family businesses. So this happens because you have next generations who are entering the family business too. And whether they're entering the family business in day-to-day -day management or as being involved, as I earlier said, in governance on the boards, etc. But they're still involved. They're still significant shareholders and they're actually influencing the direction of the business. So there are those methods of ways that the family family can be involved. And I think many of these families you mentioned, I think, have that ability to influence the business successfully going forward. Right. So you're also in some ways saying that there is a self-correcting mechanism and which is reflected in the final outcome or the data that you talked about. Because the, where I'm coming from is really the shareholder anxiety that one may see at this point. So if you take all the examples that I mentioned, as a shareholder, and if I'm a significant shareholder or an institutional sh uh, shareholder, for example, and we saw it in the case of Reliance Industries, where the you know, Institutional Investor Advisory Services uh, 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 said, or rather, uh, presented a point of view that they were not comfortable with one of the uh, three children that were being taken on the board. Uh, their point was that there wasn't sufficient, there was not enough experience and so on. And that was their recommendation, uh, which of course didn't matter eventually, but uh, that that was definitely a point of view. And we're increasingly, thanks to institutional investor participation and uh, let's say their vocal uh, presence, they, we are seeing those points of view. So uh, uh, what's your sense? So if, if let's say, uh, as a shareholder, if I was if I was not sure uh, or I was anxious, uh, one is of course I put my foot down and vote whether or not that vote goes through. But the fact is that uh, uh, a concerned or a proactive business leader would address this uh, uh, more upfront than perhaps waiting for something you know like a bomb to land on the uh, board table, boardroom table, literally, and then try and defuse it. No, I agree with you in the sense that I don't think that's the right, uh, you know, um, I, I think these are things which have to be sort of worked in the background first. Um, and you have to actually, firstly, the person has to be the right person um, where there is general consensus that the person is adequately prepared, that the person is actually right for the job, if the person is going to be entering the business, um, and even as a board member, I think you need adequate preparation as a board member too. So, so I think there has to be a lot of groundwork done ahead of time. And it cannot be just assumed that because the member, the person is a family member that you automatically qualify. So I think, I think there is that responsibility and particularly when you have you know, outside shareholders uh, that you have to satisfy. Uh, but on the other hand, there is also some need for correcting perceptions that family members are not professional. And I think that's something which we have to do. Unfortunately, most of us go to business schools in the Anglo-Saxon world. And in the Anglo-Saxon world, family business does not have necessarily an a entirely positive image because it is actually, you have examples of family businesses where things have gone wrong. And it's always the the sad stories which make the headlines. But actually, what we really need to do better in family business uh, is actually provide a greater sense of advocacy for the good things that happen. And I think that can change perceptions. It can change perceptions of the media, change per perceptions of the general public. And I think that's a job we need to do as well. So let me uh, ask you a question uh, which tries to look at the, look at it from inside out rather than outside in. So when you talk to uh, business leaders, uh, maybe some of the names I've mentioned as well, they must be and there will be uh, a lot of uh, back channel, let's say, uh, deliberations and discussions going on. The external, to the external world, the business leader says, okay, this is my successor. Uh, she, he is my uh, daughter's son and uh, she, he will take over and, uh, you know, is presented to the world as such. Uh, the story uh, behind the scenes uh, may obviously not be as simple and uh, uh, the business leader who obviously by definition has built the business from scratch, is, has nerves of steel, is battle hardened and all of that uh, will want to ensure that the business obviously does not go down the tube. So how have you seen this play out? 
again again i think it has to be firstly a very serious conversation in the family whether it's right for that potential successor to step into the role um and to step into the role as a successor to the senior gen yeah in the same way and and i think that that conversation is essential for that to happen and it has to be a conversation which goes on for a long period of time and there has to be general comfort that the person is adequately qualified because ultimately you as a family leader a family member who's leading the business you're concerned about the valuation you do not want to see that valuation of your holding for a business that you have built for years to be eroded uh because of wrong you know uh the person is the wrong person so i think it's very important to make sure that that successor is in fact the best person for the job so that's a fundamental requirement but what i would like to also qualify and say is that one should not assume that the next gen just because of being a family member is not the best person qualified sure. to lead when you have been exposed to a business to which you deeply understand because you're exposed to it from the time you're 5 years old where you can begin to comprehend things you have a deep understanding of the business and you develop a deep understanding of a business which no non family member no matter how bright how well qualified has the privilege of having and as a result that deep understanding can sometimes make you a very successful leader for the business so you have to balance the two so it has to be that it's the right person but just because you're a family member it doesn't mean that you are less qualified to lead the business at the same time if you're not adequately qualified it's best not to you know push someone into a position which will cause problems later yeah so to come back to the 2024 uh, i don't know if conundrum is the right word but because we are going to see mm. transitions at least uh, you know some mm. uh, advanced some beginning uh, some maybe they will sort of get start getting seeded is is it is is it your sense that uh, most of these large businesses which will see transition are doing it reasonably well and as close to textbook as possible i think some are i think some are definitely doing so because they've had the right i would say you know um family business education i'm 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 i qualify that you know in the sense that it's not just business ex- education but it's family business ex- education in terms of whether it's how you prepare the next gen how you how you get the next gen to work with non family professionals all of that um and also attitudes of senior gen and the next gen in terms of how they will manage transition and where it is clear that that next gen is possibly not the right person to lead the business as a ceo uh perhaps find the right role for that next gen uh to still influence the business be on the board uh contribute to the values the purpose of the business but not lead the business as a ceo and i think in many of these family uh businesses that you've named i think to some extent that's happening so there are some where you're going to see the family member take leadership position and in some you will probably find that no it won't be the family member but the family member will be involved in the governance of the company and i think both are fine both are equally fine so I, I, i'm sure people would have reached out to you now i'm talking about let's say the existing generation uh, or the current generation of business leaders in transition uh, and with both situations uh, or at least if you're maybe uh, i'm sure you're aware of them where in one case uh, the the senior uh, business leader says i want my uh, daughter's son to take over and that person is not interested and uh, i mean i've seen some cases too 
uh, and the and the opposite of that is I don't want my uh, daughter son to take over because this is too big uh, uh, for whatever reason. I'm emotionally too attached to it. I feel uh, this person is uh, uh, is good but not good enough for this role or this business and so on. So uh, your your uh, what have your experiences been like? How have you responded? Well, in that case, I, what we always talk about is that you have to look at what's right for your family and for the, the, your family business. And I think it's necessary for that recognition to be arrived at through consensus between the two generations. So, and that happens if you have the right, um, as I keep saying, the right exposure to family business education. If you have the right exposure and you have actually over years uh, seen other families deal with similar situations, whether in India or outside India, and we have enough examples of, of success and failure as well for people to learn from. And that's what we actually within FBN, what do we do? We actually provide that opportunity and we provide that opportunity for families to learn from each other. So you get exposure and you actually sit down and there's no better teacher than someone who's been through a similar experience. So if it can be a realization at both, at both generation levels that this is the right thing for us, for our family business going forward, and the person is adequately qualified and prepared, then it's the right thing to do. And, and, you, and I think you can convince people, you can convince your institutional investors as well. And if it's not the right thing, then why, why go through that process? And it's not, right, it's, it's not, a, it's not appropriate for you, me to feel that, no, my, my son or my daughter is the right person for this when it's actually not the case. And if the person doesn't want it in the first place, you can't force that because then you're actually, it's a recipe for failure going forward then. Right. So, so you're saying that people are, by, uh, by inference, having these tough conversations, and I'm talking about the, the existing generation of business leaders with their potential successors, and uh, therefore, and are obviously arriving at some kind of, uh, you know, understanding on whether there is a future or not. Uh, with that. So, I mean, of course, one is, of course, uh, this is by inference that these conversations are happening. Second is, how tough or easy are these in your experience, uh, particularly in the last few years? Yeah, very tough. These are very tough conversations uh, because, you know, you have to first align expectations and you have to align the expectations across the generations. And this is one thing which we do uh, and what we encourage uh, you know, within FBN for people to do is to have these conversations within the family first. Um, you know, we talk about family constitutions. That family constitution is actually, it's a document, but really it's not that important a document. It's the process which you go through to establish that document, which is far more important because you have those conversations in arriving at it. So when people say that, no, we've been given this family constitution by our consultant, it's the absolute wrong way to go about it. Because then you try and, you know, adapt your family to that document, as opposed to adopting, coming up with something which works for your family. And when you go through those conversations, you actually then will determine whether it's right for the next gen woman or male member to enter the family business uh, in a leadership capacity. So th those conversations are extremely important and not all families do this, unfortunately. And that's when you then have kind of, you know, um, um, breakdown in communication and then putting wrong people in, in positions as well. Right. And the other important and interesting point that you mentioned right in the beginning is gender and the rise of, uh, let's say, second generation women leaders. Uh, the, some of the examples that we've seen, uh, maybe uh, Godrej is one example, one of the Kirloskars in Pune where you are, 
uh, uh, Metropolis Labs, uh, I had an opportunity to interview the current, uh, the managing director, Amira Shah, just a few days ago. Uh, so these are cases where uh, everyone is obviously happy because these companies are doing well. They've uh, set uh, standards of uh, excellence, leadership and all of that. And shareholders are the best judge, so we'll leave it at that. My question is, uh, when you look at some of the other cases, where let's say there is uh, a male uh, a successor and a, a female successor, or there's a son and a daughter involved, the, the historical precedence is that the son gets the, uh, uh, gets the mantle, uh, and particularly in many communities. Today, are you sensing that uh, parents and the business leaders and parents are more uh, equal in the way they look at succession, and if so or not so, how are they handling it? No, I think I think there is change which is happening. Uh, where you are, you're absolutely right that this was not the case earlier, but I think it is definitely uh, changing for you know a m much more equal um, consideration today than it used to be. Uh, again, it sort of depends a little bit on the family sort of tradition and history, etc. Um, and where you've had a long history, it's often more difficult to change it because, you know, one is resistant to make change happen. Uh, but I think the change is actually happening because it needed to happen and because women rightfully are demanding their equal uh, position uh, in this. And in many cases, if the woman is more qualified than the male uh, potential successor, then, you know, it's the right thing for the business as well. It's the right thing for the family and eventually for, you know, the, the, uh, the investing community as well, isn't it? So I think it is changing. It is right. changing and it's, it's high time that it's, it, 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 it had to change. Right. And, and I should have added the uh, Reliance and the Ambani's to that mix because uh, in, in the case mm. the second generation, uh, clearly there is a daughter who has equal standing uh, amongst uh, right. her brothers. Right. So uh, in, in the mm, succession. Which is very good. Yeah. So uh, uh, last uh, question or two, uh, Mr. Forbes. So as you look ahead uh, into 2024 and maybe 25, uh, how are you seeing the, the patterns of uh, in, in the way family run businesses will be run, uh, succession and what other issues or challenges are you seeing if there are challenges? Uh, in the way uh, we are going to see ownership and ownership transition in India? So I think it's going to be it's going to be very much more now um, that the person has to be qualified adequately. So you're going to see that as being a fundamental requirement, you're going to see much more variance as well, whether, you know, family member takes on that leadership role, you find that there will be some where it will happen, and there will be some where it won't happen. And it will be equally acceptable for both situations. So I think I'm positive, at least that family businesses are sufficiently being sufficiently smart in terms of how they are considering succession going forward. So I think they will make right choices. You will always have a few wrong choices, but by and large, they will make right choices and there will be an equal amount of going one way or the other. And no, no one particular method is going to be the right one. So that's the first thing. So I think you will have qualified good successes, whether family or non-family. Second, you will see family involved in business in different ways and more, and that provides more opportunity for other family members, uh, not just the one successor, but other family members to influence a business through you know, a family council, uh, where the family council elects um, members to the board of the family business um, so it becomes more representative and you get you get inputs from the rest of the family as well 
and provides more ownership of the family to the purpose of the business. So that's going to happen. And then the third is, I think, in the overall context, you know, we're seeing great emphasis now on ESG and the UN SDGs. And we think, you know, well, oh, this is really meant, meant for, you know, listed large family firms, which are not fa- are non-family firms. But actually, that's not the case. If we really want to make an impact on SDGs, um, if you look at the contribution that family businesses make globally uh, in terms of whether it's employment, whether it's contribution to GDP uh, and the no- sheer number of firms, if we can get family firms to really adopt an attitude which is positive towards ESGs and the SDGs, you can have far greater impact on the world, whether it's on the environment, whether it's on the social uh, goals, or whether it's on governance. And that's one of the things we're trying very much in FBN to actually expose our members and get them to actually adopt and do positive steps, whether it's business transformation, whether it's in their philanthropy, whether it's in uh, how they consider making investments either directly as family or through their family offices or as the family business. Uh, And finally, in how they influence others to do the same through advocacy. Uh, So we're trying to do much more of this. And I think you will see family firms actually uh, taking a leadership role in addressing many of these global concerns. Right. And last question. So, you know, we've focused mostly on succession um, and somewhat deliberately for the chronological reasons that I outlined earlier, uh, being that next year we're likely to see some of this. The other situation that, uh, again, externally uh, stakeholders are obviously always worried about is splits uh, within families. And we've seen some big ones in the past. Uh, I don't know if that's so much of an issue right now, but your broad Thoughts on, uh, is that something that uh, will be on the minds of business leaders as well, particularly where there are such families involved in the next year or so? Or will the focus be more likely on succession, at least uh, as I could see from the outside? No, I think uh, it's a very valid concern. And uh, the splits happen. The splits happen for essentially, you know, the main reason is that you know uh, there's a misalignment of values uh, often and a misalignment in terms of communication about um, whether it's who in the family should be involved, um, how they get involved, and also in terms of you know in terms of ownership and valuations and things like that and I think you're going to see quite a bit of that continuing to happen. Uh, It happens all over the world. And it happens mainly because one hasn't invested enough time in family governance education. And uh, unfortunately, what tends to happen is that we spend much more time learning about how to manage our business, whether it's strategy, finance, marketing, etc. And we don't invest enough time on family governance education. And you see these splits happening usually in families where they haven't invested adequate time in that, unfortunately. So that's, that's something which uh, will happen. But I think if you look at Going forward, as far as India is concerned, yes, there will be these major succession issues to deal with. And there will be the occasional splits, which you will hear about. And, you know, some are more public than others. And people do it in different ways. And there are some which are very contentious, sadly, uh, because it destroys the relationships which exist in the family. And it just often destroys value, destroys valuation as well. And you will see some splits which will happen, which will be done very amicably and uh, constructively. So I don't think there's going to be a universal one way again on that. Right, uh, Mr. Forbes, we run out of time. Thank you so much for uh, speaking with me and sharing your thoughts quite candidly as it were. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Govind.